Good morning, everybody. Boy, what a blessing that service was this morning. I'm just so thankful. Uh, I'm thankful that Ben's selected the way he's done the last two or three weeks and bringing us through Isaiah 53 like that. It's just a perfect introduction uh, to what we'll be celebrating next Sunday on Easter Sunday. Uh, we're studying the seven churches of Revelation, chapters two and three, as a class, so hope you've been with us through all of them. This morning, we're gonna be studying the church at Pergamum, and if you'd like to turn your Bible or look at your handout, either one, it's Revelation 2, 12, and you'll get to that. Uh, this is a relatively short letter. I wanna uh, reemphasize or, or reiterate that these seven letters in chapters two and three were given uh, to the Apostle John directly from the mouth of Jesus Christ. In point of fact, according to chapter one, John is looking at him while he's giving him these seven letters. Uh, this is face-to-face -face revelation. And yes, these are letters to seven churches. You know, there were real churches that existed back there in the first century. We know that. Archaeologists have studied it. It's established. So yes, their primary reason for writing was to those seven churches. However, it's long been understood and appreciated that also these seven letters are to be taken as, as uh, models for what the church at any time in any place should be. I mean, it's rare We've got so much of the New Testament from people like Peter and, and from Paul and John even instructing us what the church should be like, don't we? They, they were very helpful to us in that. But it is so unique in that in these seven letters, we've actually got the words from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself about what he thinks church ought to be like. And so I, I hope that, you know, you're able to keep that in mind. Yes, you know, study these people in the first century in these churches. Yes, do that. But also think about Travis Avenue Baptist Church as we go through this. Because I'm assuming if you're here, the Lord has placed you here. This is your church. And you're uh, like everyone else. I assume, I always assume this, that we want to see the Lord move in our church. I, I do. I you know, I pray, and I know you do too, I pray for glory to fall down on this church. Uh, I, I pray for souls to be saved and uh, families to be put back together and healed. There's just, just it's just so vital uh, to treasure Travis Avenue Baptist Church if he's put you here and seek God's face for it. So, Yes, Pergamum people. Uh, yes, Travis people, as we go through this. And so to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him that has the sharp two-edged sword. Now all these letters, they all start out the same. They say to the angel. And it's not an angel, angel, a uh, supernatural being. He's talking probably to the pastor or the elder of each one of these churches. And the reason I say that, I'm sorry I'm repetitious, but because in every one of these letters he tells whoever that angel is to repent. So I believe it was a human leader in the church, all right. Now Pergamum, it's a, a, it's a city, it's a, it's a little city in Turkey. Uh, it's, about, uh, it's about 18 miles north of Smyrna where we studied last week. Uh, not really a, you know, a major city of the Roman Empire. They estimate that but when this letter was written, there were 200,000 people that lived there. So Fort Worth's a lot bigger than, than Pergamon is here. Now, it's a, it was a unique city. Alvin, do you have that picture for after a while? You what? Okay. Pergamon is, is a city that the, <clears throat> it's thought that the god Zeus was born there. 
Zeus, Greek god, that he was born there and they built a great uh, throne. It's called the throne of Zeus. And uh, it's set up on a real high hill in Pergamum. If you lived in Pergamum from just about anywhere in town, you could look up on that hill and see Zeus. He was a 40 foot tall idol sitting on a chair or his throne. And you could see him up there and it just sort of dominated the whole town. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> Having an eye overlooking your city. I mean, goodness, what made me very nervous. Now, the city, Pergamum, is also unique in something else. How many of you have ever heard of the Library of Alexandria? Anyone ever heard reference to, to that? It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was the largest library in the ancient world. Uh, vast amounts of scrolls and, and uh, books and learning. Well, I bet you didn't know this. The Library of Alexandria was a library that started out in Pergamum, where we're going to study this morning. Mark Anthony, the Roman general, funded and created the Library of Pergamum. And then he fell in love with this girl from Egypt. Her name was Cleopatra. And Mark thought he'd do a nice thing for Cleopatra, and he gave her the library of Pergamum. And little Cleopatra boxed it all up and took it to Alexandria, Egypt, where it was the wonder of the world for uh, several hundred years until it burned to the ground one day. Well, that's perfect. That's the, the church. Now, it's a Gentile city, although there's a lot of Jews there probably. But here's the thing I want uh, you to understand. These were people. Uh, they might have been Gentile. They might have been Jew, but they were families. Uh, there were husbands and wives and their children in this church. There were... There were uh, slaves in this church. You know, it's said in the Roman Empire, some say that as many as three out of every five people in the first century were slaves in Rome. That's a lot of people, isn't it? The majority. They were Christians. They were saved too. They were in the church. Now these people, being new Christians, being Christians in Pergamum in particular, they had a rough road to hope. Because they live in the city where the throne of Zeus is. It dominates their entire city life. So we need to pay particular attention as we go through these few verses. What is it that Jesus wants to put his finger on to that church and perhaps to our church as well? Right? We want to know what, what he thought. Now, it starts off talking about Jesus out of his mouth with a sharp two-edged sword. Now, I don't know if you're visualizing that in your mind when I read that, or if you're, you're already processing it, and you know what that means. I don't know. I don't have time to ask each one of you. But I want you to understand something. Remember when we started, I told you that a lot of, we're gonna go through the whole book of Revelation here, friends. I, I want you to know that. A lot of people are afraid of this book. A lot of people wrote it off a long time ago. They say it scares me. They say I don't understand it. They say, oh, there's different interpretations, so I just don't want any of it. You know, there's all kinds of things like that that people say. My only problem with that is it's the it's the Word of God. That's number one. Number two, it's the last book of the Word of God. It is the ultimate Word of God before heaven comes. It's an important book. And I'm going to do my very best to make it uh, understandable for you and me as we go through this. But here's a principle. When Revelation has images like a sword coming out of his mouth, don't get all excited and think it's some kind of fantasy or it's some kind of comic book. The way you understand Revelation is being familiar with the rest of the books of the Bible. John is, is writing images that communicate. Now you should already know that. 
For instance, with this one, let me just show you. The book of Hebrews, Hebrews 4.12, do you know it by heart? For the word of God is living, listen, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's where John's getting that image. He's giving us a picture of Jesus with the word of God coming out of his mouth. The Apostle Paul, Ephesians 6, 17, what did he say? He said uh, that we are to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All right, so you don't have to you don't have to fantasize when we read a, a Revelation 2, 12 about this picture. You don't have to make something up. Uh, you don't have to go find some teacher somewhere that'll tell you what that means. Uh, as we go through this book, we will consistently try, when we see images like this, to apply them to what the Word of God says elsewhere about what these things mean. It's not our business to make up stuff about what the book of Revelation means. It's not. And God forbid that you would. Uh, there's actually, there's a curse for people to do that in chapter 22, so don't do it. Look at the Word of God. Now, verse 13, he's, here it is. This is, this is shocking. Jesus said to these people, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you. So here it is again, where Satan dwells. Now, I said that was shocking. It is to me. I don't know if it is to you. Uh, I understand and I, I've been taught by the Word of God, Satan is real. He was a former archangel of God who has fallen. Uh, he is the prince of the power of the air now. He's in this world. He can only be in one place at one time. He's not omnipresent like God is. But, but nonetheless, uh, what a gruesome thought to think that the city that you've chosen to raise your family and start a church perhaps and go to worship in Sunday school like these Christians of Pergamum and then the Lord Jesus himself says you're living in the town where Satan has chosen to dwell. So he can only be at one place at one time. At this particular time his place was Pergamum. Now it's interesting that Jesus said where Satan's throne is. That's a pretty unique clue to let us think a little bit. And what I'm thinking about is that. That altar to Zeus, a 40-foot tall statue of Zeus sitting on his throne. Now, Paul, Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians said that uh, those that worship idols are worshiping demons. That's pretty, pretty strong language from Paul. I, I concur. I don't have any problem with that. That Jesus is pointing out that here in this little town of Pergamum, there was a throne and Satan was sitting on it. And it's also a place where he lived or he dwelled. Satan, you know, a lot of people in our culture, not in the church so much, but in our culture, oftentimes you will see Satan depicted as being in hell. He'll be that uh, one with the with the funny tail and the horns, uh, just ridiculous. Number one, he doesn't look like that, and number two, he's not in hell. He's here. At this present time, Satan is the God of this world. You remember that Luke 4, when Jesus was tempted by him, what he did? He said he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said, all of this I'll give to you if you'll bow down and worship me. Did you notice Jesus didn't correct him? He rebuked him, but he didn't challenge what Satan said about that. Satan is going to go to hell <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 20. We'll get there. Right now he's not in hell. 
He's, as Peter said, he's going up and down in the earth as a roaring lion, hunting for whom he may devour. That's where he is. Satan's throne, Satan's dwelling place. Now notice, if you will, in verse 13 something, uh, Jesus said something about a man by the name of Antipas, and uh, he calls him his faithful martyr. Now, I think you'll agree with me. Uh, just having your name mentioned in the Bible is quite an honor. But being called a faithful martyr is much more. The reason I say that is if you'll go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus identifies himself as the faithful martyr. Yes. Now, we get over here to 2.13, he identifies Antipas as a faithful martyr, just like he is. Now, we're not given a lot of details about this man, this Christian man. Uh, when he's called faithful martyr, I think we can assume that he was killed for the faith, for his confession in Christ, living in those Roman times. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us much about this, this man. But we do know this. Because of verse 12, we know that he lived in the city where Satan's throne was. He was a resident of Pergamum in the city where Satan lived. The consequences, evidently, I think we can draw directly that living a faithful uh, Christian confession in a Roman idolatrous city that just so happened to be the place where Satan's throne was led to his death, yes. his confession. Now, something interesting. Uh, church history is important for all of us to it, I don't know if you like history or not. Maybe you don't even like history. But it's important to study church history. There's 2,000 years of it, right? And you learn a lot. And what really begins to happen as you study it, as you begin to see, you begin to see that there's nothing new going on in our world today that has not already happened in the life of the church over those 2,000 years. We're not that creative. We're not that smart either. I mean, friends, the people that you know have gone before us, those that, that we're standing on their shoulders, our spiritual ancestors, they fought the good fight. And Antipas is just one of thousands of examples of this that, for instance, martyr, that word is a Greek word. It's not an English word. It's a Greek word. Now, when I say martyr, what do you think about? Do you, do you picture somebody that dies for their faith? That's typically what we think of in the 21st century. But that's not what the word means. In the Greek language, martyr is the Greek word that means witness. Witness. That's, it's very simple, very clear. So, in the first century, Antipas would have been someone that notice he was a witness who was faithful. What does that mean? Well, a witness is someone that says, this is what I believe, this is what I saw, this is what I am, am sure is true, and I'm telling you the truth. That's a witness. In this case, I have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has forgiven me of my sins. I've been saved. I have a, a hope in heaven. He gave a Christian witness. Antipas did. And I don't know if he gave it to, I don't know if he gave it to Zeus or if he gave it to the Roman uh, officials of Pergamum. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Point is, it cost him his life. Yes. Now, it's interesting that over the centuries, and there have been literally millions of Christians who have sacrificed their lives to the point of death and blood for their faith or the confession of Jesus Christ. 
to the point that it's happened so much now that the word martyr in Greek has taken on a new meaning. For us, it's, it's not witness. For us, it's somebody that died, in this case, for Jesus Christ. Now, both are true. Uh, both are okay. And I'm not trying to get you to switch from one to the other. But just to understand the scope of Christian history and church history and understand uh, it causes me to appreciate so much the lives of those that have gone before us. Now, the, verse 14, this is the point of the letter. This in the next verse. Jesus has got the church of Pergamum's attention and he said, now I've got a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. Uh, here's the problem. Now, I just don't know what I'd do. If I came up here to church some Sunday and uh, Ben, uh, one of the elders told me, well, we've got a letter here that was brought to us by the Lord this week. And it's addressed to Travis Avenue, and uh, we're supposed to open it up in a big worship service and read it. I, I don't know what I'd do. I honestly don't. I wouldn't know whether to cheer or to run. Yeah. Because that's what this is. He's, he's, he's commended them for their church, for standing faithful, and Antipas, a good deal. And then he says, listen, I got something against you. We need to talk. Now he points out something to this church called the teachings of Balaam. And we, we're not going to go back to the Old Testament and study Balaam this morning. Don't have time. If you are a student and you're interested Go back to Numbers 22 through 25. It's quite a long story. And uh, it's very easy to understand what the problem was back there. Uh, Balaam was a prophet. And Balak, a pagan from Moab, came to him, the king. And he said, I'm going to give you some money. If you go out here on the hilltop and look out over the valley, that's where all the children of Israel were marching on their way to the promised land. He said, if you go out there on the hilltop and curse them, I want you to curse them. Make God angry with them and make fire come down. And he went out there and he was, and I'll give you some money, by the way. I'll give you a bunch of money if you'll do that. And, and Balaam, he went out there and he tried it. And when he tried to curse the children of Israel, out of his mouth came blessing. And it just, it just confused him to no end. And that story happened three times. Three times he tried to curse Israel, and God overwhelmed his sinful tongue, and out of his mouth came a blessing for Israel. So that didn't work. So what he did was, he went into town, and he hired a bunch of beautiful women. Maidens, they were called. Virgins, they were called. He hired them and had them, I guess, getting on scantily dressed uh, apparel, and go parading out in front of the children of Israel down there in the valley. And it says to young men, young men of Israel corrupted themselves with those women and began to worship their gods and live in immorality and sin. Now that's the teaching of Balaam. Now, the teaching of Balaam is this. If you can't get your own way in open disobedience to God, get it by trickery and scheming. Get it through offering people sexual favors in order to get what you want. Balaam could not spiritually curse the people of God, but he could trick them by leading them into sexual immorality and in doing so, he corrupted their hearts yeah. and they began to worship foreign gods. Okay, so let, let me just stop. That was a long story. Notice this. Jesus is reciting this to the church at Pergamum. 
a church. Why? Well, it says, if we look back there at verse 14, he says, church, some of you, two things, some of you are practicing the teaching of Balaam, what I just described. Some of you are doing that. That's pretty bad. You're falling into sexual immorality and sin. That's bad. But I want you to notice there's another group there in verse 14. He says, there's some of you who are putting up with this in your church. You're tolerating it. You know what's going on, but you're not doing anything about it. This is the lesson for church right here. That's the heart of the lesson. This letter to Pergamum is sure Jesus is angry about those who follow the teachings of Balaam. Sure. And he's also angry about the people that follow the teachings of the Nicolaitans, which we'll get to in the next verse or two. Sure, I understand that. But the message, notice this, this message does not appear to be directed to the followers of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. It's directed to the church. And so I'm suggesting to you that our role, your role, all of our role together as the body of Christ here at this place that we've joined is to play a role in protecting the godly teaching of the scriptures. These people had two different kinds of false teachers in their church, and they were tolerating it. Yeah. And so, you might say to me, well, that's the elder's job to guard the doctrine. It is, but it's your job too. Yeah. This is directed to the church people. Uh, you need to be a student of the Word of God. Every one of you need to be a student of the Word of God. And being so, the Holy Spirit is going to be able to witness to you truth that you'll be able to, to, to hear various teachers. Uh, and this will apply to books that we read, videos that we watch, movies that we go see. The teaching, the charisma, the doctrine of the church that's the function of the church. You should know when you hear it. That's not right. You believe me? Yes. Some of you are looking at me like, where'd you come up with that? Uh, this is truth. Uh, this is what exactly what 14 is. Jesus is talking to the church. Let's go on. Verse 15, he says, you also have some that hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, I want to do a little wordplay here. Look at verse 14 and look at verse 15. And you'll notice the phrase, you have those there. In the next verse, you also have those. Those two little phrases. Both of those are indicating that he's talking to the congregation of the church. He's talking, you get, you've got some of those Balaams and you've got some of those Nicolaitans, but he's not talking to them, to the Nicolaitans and the Balaams. He's talking to the church. You're responsible for your church. I mean, you'd agree with me, wouldn't it, that you're responsible to support this church financially and your, give, your, your gifts and your tithes? I mean, you don't argue with me about that, do you? Well, in the same regard, we all have a responsibility to protect this church from false teachers. And that's what Pergamum is struggling with. For some reason, and I won't put words in their mouth, they have decided to just get along and go along. That I'm not going to raise the stink. I know those people are, are wrong, but I'm not the same thing. I'm just going to go about my business and go to worship service, go to Bible study, and let it be. Friends, I know this might be uncomfortable to you, but Jesus does not like that. He does not like us to be tolerant of false teaching.
Therefore, repent, verse 16. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Uh, there's that word again, repent. We studied that last week. Turn around, change your mind. Remember, repent. That's, that's common to all these letters. And Jesus is telling the church at Pergamum, change your ways. You can change. Now, that's the glory. That's the glory of the gospel. You can change. You don't have to be the way you are. Isn't that good news? You don't. You can repent. That's your way out. Or else I'll come to you quickly and notice, you know, what he's, what he's, what he's saying here is what we began with in this lesson this morning. He's coming to them with the word of God applied to this heresy, yes. to the Nicolaitans and the Balaamites. He's going to bring the word of God to bear on them and uh, war against them. Now he says, he that's got an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one that conquers, I'll give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone, and with a new name written on the stone, that no one knows except the one that receives it. That, that's quite a, quite a verse uh, to consider. Each letter closes with this phrase to he that has an ear. And I saw a couple of you reach out and, and see if you had an ear. Uh, that's not what it means. It means to, to those that are willing to listen to me, there's hope. If you've got an ear and you'll hear what I'm saying to you, you're going to be okay. Matter of fact, he says you will conquer there in verse uh, 17. To he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, and to the one who conquers, I'll give of the hidden manna. Now, I was intrigued by this, uh, this uh, promise from Jesus. I mean, I'm a New Testament guy, as are you, guy and gal. Man is something from the Old Testament. We all know the story of manna, how out of the wilderness the people were grumbling that they didn't have any food, and God provided manna from heaven for them fresh every morning. Yes. So I want to talk to you about that for a minute. Because it's, notice that it's a promise here in verse 17. I'm going to give you some of the hidden manna, underscore hidden manna. Watch that. Let's, let's see where that goes. Uh, we all know they didn't have any food in the desert, right? Uh, they, they were probably a couple of million strong marching through the wilderness toward the promised land. And for 40 years, every morning, God brought fresh manna to the people of Israel. And they uh, took it and they ate and they lived and they survived. Uh, when they got to the promised land, the manna quit coming down from heaven every morning. Now, the Jewish people, uh, they ate it and it kept them alive. Uh, but after manna was gone, when it wasn't coming down anymore, the memory of what God did with manna remained with the Jewish people. It was important to them because they thought, my goodness, we were out in the desert, two million people with nothing to eat, and every day God gave us exactly what we needed to eat. It was a truly a mir miracle. Well, they took a pot of manna, the Jew, Jews did, and they put it inside the Ark of the Covenant. It was, it was that important to them. It was a wonderful memory that they had, and they wanted to honor the Lord by it, and rightfully so. Uh, later on, they took that pot of manna, and they put it in the Holy of Holies when they had a tabernacle built. And then later on, they built a wonderful temple in Jerusalem. And guess what? They took that pot of manna and they put it in the temple. And it was thought that it remained that way up until the temple was destroyed in the sixth century. Now, manna, in this case, in this verse, Jesus is talking to them like this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is John 6, 32. 
Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, the manna, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. All right? So you see, friends, once again, I want to illustrate for you how we're going to go through the book of Revelation. I didn't make up some interpretation about what the hidden man of means in verse 17. I'm saying you compare scripture with scripture to understand the book of Revelation. And that's what we're all going to try to do together as we go through this book. Now he said, I'm going to give him a white stone. Uh, interesting, uh, very common in the first century, a white stone. Uh, they used this, this for... They used it for tickets to come into parties. Uh, it was a sign of friendship. When somebody liked each other, they'd give each other, they'd give each other a white stone. Uh, it was used to vote with, count votes. Uh, it was used in court. If you were found innocent of your charges, they would give you a white stone, and you were happy to get it. Well, Jesus says, I'm going to give you... Now, this is the church at Pergamum, and it's you. I'm going to give you a white stone and a new name. Now, what's your name going to be? You're pretty used to your name. I, I am. I'm pretty used to my name. What does that mean? Well, it, it, in the scripture, it's very clear what that means that you think about all the people in the Old Testament where God changed their name. You remember Abram to Abraham, Jacob to Israel, Sarai to Sarah. There's a bunch more. I won't go into them. But every time that that takes place in the Old Testament, it means something. It means God has come, placed his hands on their shoulder, and looked at them and bless them with a new walk with him, a new relationship with him, a new intimacy with him, a new, new fellowship with him. Every time that happens. So, you think it's good right now? I hope you have the joy of the Lord this morning. I, I really do. I, I hope you're just overflowing with joy. But friends, it's going to get a lot better. When your old nature is cleansed, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit for all eternity, never to leave again, it's going to be a lot better. And you think that you know Jesus now, walking by faith with him, and you do. God bless you. But you, don't, you haven't even begun to know the riches of his glory and his majesty. You haven't even got started. When you're in his presence and faith has turned to sight, and he's never going to be out of your sight again. He's going to be with you, talking with you, holding on to you, counseling you, showing you things, teaching you things forever. I think that's what a white stone and a new name is coming from the Lord here. Father, we pray this morning to thank you for the Christians at Pergamum. I know, Lord, that... Uh, People like Antipas represented you faithfully, and they stood up for your name. I know, Lord, there were probably just a lot of just good folks in that church that just wanted to, to earn a living, provide for their family, go to church, and worship you. Uh, Lord, I know that you loved each and every one of them in a tender and personal way, too. And bless you, Lord, for having them with you in heaven. Father, we pray this morning and we ask you, please, uh, allow us, Heavenly Father, during these few weeks of studying these seven lessons, let the Holy Spirit speak clearly uh, and personally to each and every one of us of the role that we can play uh, to make Travis Avenue a place where you put us to be the church that you desire. And God, we do pray for your, your glory to fall for your sake for the sake of lost people around us and for the sake of the broken and the hurting and the sick that are in our midst. 
For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.